Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street from Main Street and Phil Kennedy of Kennedy Financial. Welcome back to another Welcome to Dystopia podcast. This is episode number 42. So you guys may have noticed in the introduction, I have a new co-pilot, a new co-host, Phil Kennedy of Kennedy Financial. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Jason. You know, like I've been telling you uh, as we've been friends and in the pre-interview before we went live here, you are a macro genius. You know everything about how the world economy works and where I see myself fitting in is more of a color commentary guy for folks who've listened to the Kennedy Financial Podcast. I'm more into microeconomics. You know, how does the government and its policies affect the little man? So I think we're going to be a, a good team here on Welcome to Dystopia. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to crack some jokes and sarcasm and gal's humor and reintegrate that more into the show. I think, you know, I'm responsible for this, too, that we just, the I don't know, for a while now, a lot of the past Welcome to Dystopia episodes just didn't have as much sarcasm and humor as I would have liked to put in the show. Yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. You know, I think we're a pretty natural fit. I know I've been on your show and you've been on mine and we'll have fun because really that's what the audience wants. I mean, we are living through some kind of uh, science fiction dystopian novel, but we got to kind of keep our heads up, especially in this alternative financial commentary community. And it's good to laugh through it. And, you know, we're, we're all taking steps to try to get through it. So uh, it doesn't it doesn't hurt if we can make fun of some of these things, because if you're not laughing, you're going to be crying about some of these policies and the impact they've had on humanity over the last couple decades. Oh, my God, you just read my mind. I was literally about to say I would rather laugh instead of cry. <laughs> yeah, we'll be laughing. Yeah, everything's Orwellian. So uh, as many of my listeners know, I've been following what's been going on with the European Union, European banks for years now. So I think the main things that are going on right now, the current events are the European Union stuff, especially with Italy. So let's talk about some of this stuff chronologically. So, Phil, you and I, before we started recording, we were discussing how both of us agree that basically the European Union, for a lot of different reasons, whether they're financial, allowing countries in there that should not, they had really bad balance sheets and were enormous debtor nations, should not have been allowed into the European Union in the first place, and other political and social reasons, the European Union was basically destined for failure. And so there's an article that came out about two years ago. We'll attach a link to it if our listeners didn't see this uh, from other past interviews and episodes I've done. But there was a, a really interesting article about two years ago around Brexit from Ambrose Pritchard Evans. And it's talking about how, you know, the European Union was planned for decades and it was mostly something that like FDR, the CIA and other American globalists uh, wanted. And so even though for a lot of different reasons, a lot of people knew it wouldn't work, they persevered anyways with basically bubblegum and duct tape, currency swaps, totalitarian government and, you know, other non-freedom, non-liberty measures to basically keep the zombie alive. Yeah, no, they have. I mean, it really goes to show you just how much power the United States has had post-World War II and a lot of the chaos that we've caused while trying, seemingly on the surface, trying to do some good in the world. But I think, you know, I imagine most of your audience is from the United States. And I don't know if you travel a lot, through the states, but I do uh, during my day job as a forensic accountant. And if you go to, I was in California in October of 2016, and I saw this woman who was vigorously carrying, you know, I'm with her signs and trying to put them in people's yards. And I couldn't help to my, myself but think, you know, why bother? You know, the last, the last what, probably going all the way back to Nixon or even before the presidential election for California has gone to the Democrat. And then, you know, smash cut to uh, my buddy got married in Vermont and just going to different places, coffee shops and the mall and things like that. You can just feel the cultural differences. Yet we all speak the same language and we're all used to using the same currency because we've been doing so really since our existence. And if you could imagine if we all spoke a different language and we had different customs, we had a completely disparate cultures and we were all tried, someone tried to bring us all together under this one big umbrella you know, can you imagine how that would work? It would be destined for failure. So it's no surprise that the EU is in the situation that's currently in. Yes, and the EU should have already collapsed already from a financial standpoint, but for currency swaps. And so if you go back, and I'm, I want to handle this chronologically, if you go back 
about eight to ten years ago and go look up interviews, written articles and interviews about the European Union and the European Central Bank, basically shortly after the 2008 financial crisis, you'll see a lot of experts. And, you know, I was just starting learning. I had just gotten my first job in the financial industry around then. And I was just starting to learn more about investing, the economy, the financial system back then. And so I was watching CNBC a lot. And a lot of the talking heads who came on CNBC and Bloomberg, they brought up and the Fed was doing QE then and bailouts and TARP and stuff like that. And we didn't know about the Ron Paul one-time audit of all the currency swaps the Federal Reserve had given out at that time. And all the talking heads on TV were saying the European Central Bank, the ECB, will never do any QE programs. It's not allowed in their bylaw. They're not allowed to do bailouts like that. And so that's going to keep the European Union you know, more efficient. And I was thinking to myself, well, the Americans just changed the rules. American banks just changed the rules. And they, re they recapitalized, at least to a certain extent, American banks. And I was thinking to myself, well, these European banks... And we found out about this, you know, over the years. I did a short video on this about two years ago in July of 2016. And I went through over a dozen different articles on all the problems with the different banks in Europe all over the different countries. And I was just thinking to myself that the they're going to change the rules. They're, it's the only way to keep the system going. And we had already seen this done with the Federal Reserve bailing out basically foreign governments, foreign central banks, foreign corporations shortly during and after the 2008 financial crisis and with the QE programs. And so I was like, well, the, at some point, the European Central Bank is going to have to because we knew for years now the problems with Deutsche Bank. And then the problems were coming out about the Italian banks. Uh, recently, I just read an article from Christopher Whalen, and he has a blog website called the Institutional Risk Analyst, I believe. He's considered one of the top banking analysts for hedge funds and institutions. And he was just in Paris for a banking conference in the last couple of weeks. And he said from talking with people there, uh, listening to presentations from people from the European Central Bank and speaking to other bankers and banking analysts, that Italian banks, Phil, have a th the real number listed for non-performing loans in Italy for Italian banks is around 30%. Oh, my. Yes. And so no bank, and you know, this is with fractional reserve lending, this is with really low reserve requirements. So, you know, they're not on a gold standard, they're not keeping an enormous amount of reserves. And, you know, 30% non-performing loans basically means the entire Italian banking system, even if there's a good bank, they have counterparty risk, right? So even if it's a good bank and they were more responsible compared to other banks that weren't responsible, if they have any loans to the other banks, then those loans could default from bank to bank. And so that's why, you know, LIBOR was spiking at one point. And, you know, this basically with the Italian banking system, there's also Deutsche Bank and other European banks. It's not just within Italy. So this is a pervasive problem. And, you know, chronologically, I, I mentioned the eight to 10 years ago with the talking head saying the ECB couldn't do QE. I think things really changed for the European Central Bank almost six years ago when Mario Draghi, who, by the way, I think Mario Draghi will be parachuting out <laughs> very soon. He will not be there when the uh, shit hit, it, the, it hits the fan. Okay? Yeah, <laughs> he will. He will be gone. I think he will be gone very, very shortly. He will parachute out before probably get a like a, a board of director seat at one of the other banks or a hedge fund or something, or uh, very high paid consulting gigs like Janet Yellen or Ben Bernanke. And so, you know, the maybe European he'll write a book with something, uh, you know, in, in well, Italian or, or French with the title Courage to Act. It, or it'll be like James Comey's book. Yeah. Someone will give him a million dollars to write a, to write propaganda. <laughs> right. That belongs so, in the fiction section. Yes. Yes. And it'll be in the clearance bin tomorrow. Uh, the day after it's written, it'll be in the clearance bin. But anyways, though, uh, about six years ago, and I did a short video on this as well, about the anniversary that Mario Draghi wrote down before he was going to give a speech. He was worried about the European banking system then. He wrote he's going to do whatever it takes. And I think the market didn't believe him because the European Central Bank had not you know, changed the rules. And so this is one of the main things I've been talking about for years is that the people in power, the economic and political elites, the, po the politicians in power, the bureaucrats in power at these uh, key, you know, World, World Bank, IMF, Bank of International Settlements, uh, key regulatory agencies, and central bankers, they're just going to change the rules when reality doesn't suit them. And so that started for the European Central Bank, especially when Mario Draghi gave the whatever it takes speech. 
And so, you know, the, the bankruptcies of Deutsche Bank were delayed a long time. And they can't, obviously, with the derivatives book that Deutsche Bank has, they can't print all the money at once. I don't think that they could get away with it. But they basically just allowed a lot of these European banks to limp along. They weren't recapitalizing the amount that American banks were. So on a relative basis, American banks are in a, a lot better shape than European banks. Although, you know, if European banks start to fail, there could be a lot of counterparty risk, especially in the derivatives market. But, you know, basically for the last, I don't know, three years, it's been about two years now that I, I started doing episodes on this, either shows or short videos, that there's been QE programs. Initially, the European Central Bank said, Phil, that they were only going to give, I think, like, you know, a few billion here, tens of billions there for the bailouts. It was going to be a small amount. And so that's how they sold it to the people. The analogy is, you know, the camel gets its nose under the tent. And then, you know, once its nose is under the tent, it can get its whole body under tent and get to the food and water and stuff like that. And so, you know, once they got the small amount of QE in and the people are like, OK, fine, you know, this is going to prevent us another Cyprus bail in. This is going to prevent civil unrest. You know, the average person, when they hear things like that, they're like, OK, that makes sense. It's not a big deal. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to bail in with my bank. I don't want my stock brokerage account or bank account to close and ATMs sh to shut down. So, OK, they can do this. And that's how they sold it to the public. And now here we are, Phil, only a couple of years later, and the European Central Bank, I think their initial balance sheet was only a couple hundred billion dollars a couple of years ago. It's now in only a couple of years with their QE program, which they were initially not allowed to do. It's now almost $5 trillion. <laughs> Welcome to Dystopia, right? So that's, that's the rules changes in reality that I've been talking about for years, is you said you weren't going to do QE. Okay, now you did QE, start off a little bit, and now here we are only a couple years later. The European Central Bank balance sheet is almost $5 trillion. It's larger, their balance sheet is larger, at least publicly stated, than the Federal Reserve and the Bank of Japan's. And they've said uh, at the conference that Christopher Whalen was at, the European Central Banker who was there said that they're going to be reinvesting the balance sheet. So there's going to be no drastic reduction in QE there, and it's going to keep going. And on top of that, Phil, I still don't think it's going to be enough. <laughs> I still don't think it's going to be enough because uh, look at the intervention that they had to do this week. There was probably a massive currency swap injection. And that currency swap injection, the majority, as I was telling you before this recording, the majority of currency swap injections are from the Federal Reserve to the other central banks. The People's Bank of China is involved in the currency swap game to a, a lot lesser extent than the Federal Reserve, but they're mostly just giving it out to emerging market trading partners in exchange for long-term like off-take deals on oil and uh, mining concessions and things like that. You know, Jason, in my studies and trying to become an accountant and a fraud examiner, I remember one of the things a good professor told me, he said, there's three kinds of people. The first kind, the first 10% are people who will never lie. And those are usually guests that appear on Wall Street for Main Street. You know, your Charles Ortels, your Danielle DiMartino Boost. These are people who, no matter what, they're going to stand up and say, this is wrong, and I'm going to point to what's wrong, and I'm going to describe what's wrong and share it with the rest of the world. And then you have 80% who, given the right set of circumstances, will – or the wrong set of circumstances will steal food for their starving kids from a grocery store. And there was a video recently of, you know, cops going to this poor woman's home and she thought she was going to be arrested. And it turns out now they got together and, and bought the family groceries. And, you know, that, that made everyone feel good and because it was really a, a dire situation. But, you know, under the right circumstances, this woman would be an honest person. And then you have the bottom 10 percent. And those bottom 10 percent will find every way to lie, cheat, and steal, and they usually become politicians and central bankers. We knew all along when this EU experiment began that they would put someone in charge of it who would lie to everyone. And if anyone believed for a moment that they were never going to embark on some kind of QE program, then they were just lying to themselves. I mean, it was inevitable. So, you know, I'm not surprised that that's where we're at. And what happens over time is they condition people slowly but surely to accept these things because if they did it all at once, you know, let's take the United States for an example. You know, if all of a sudden after uh, the Roaring Twenties, they immediately, you know, took us off a of gold standard, they embarked on QE and they uh, shrank interest rates down to 500 year lows. Everyone would notice, you know, even, 
the baker and the butcher and the candlestick maker would notice something like that. But they've done it slowly over the course of almost 100 years to the point where your typical high school graduate who attends a government school has no idea what kind of money he's earning if he or she is lucky to finally land a job. So Henry Ford said it best a long time ago. You know, if the average American citizen could understand the banking system, there would be rebellion by morning or something to that effect. And uh, so, you know, for anyone who trusts these people, it, it's your own fault. We And the sh- title of your show is fitting. We, we are living through a dystopian empire that is, ne- is now global. You know, it's global as a result of the dollar being the world's reserve currency. And, and, you know, it's done well for folks like you and me in the the short run. But I think you and I are a couple of those honest people, Jason. You know, we may benefit from uh, this, again, this dollar-based world reserve currency system, but we're not afraid to talk about all the problems. Because when it does finally fall apart, it's going to be devastating. And, you know, 2008 was really just a speed bump and we didn't really fix any of those problems. And if anything, it's metastasized and we're now seeing it in the Eurozone. It's, it's manifesting itself there first. So I, I think uh, it's going to be fun to continue to monitor the situation there in the weeks ahead because it's only going to, I think, pick up speed. You know, you're already seeing problems in Deutsche Bank. Um, you know, there were problems there before, and uh, the the expansion has already lasted for what ten years now. It's already the longest economic expansion, or the second longest in uh, U.S. history. So it's uh, it's bound to come to an end. We're watching it now, and I think we're watching history right now. And we're discussing this before we start recording that Deutsche Bank basically is in the liquidation stages of a company. So they're firing CEOs or changing CEOs. Key executives are leaving uh, for the last couple of years now. They've been firing more and more employees. They've been selling their key assets, the, their key businesses that they own that make them the most money just to delay bankruptcy, to sell cash, to raise cash. So these are the things that happen in the late stage of a company, in the late cycle, before either. So Deutsche Bank may be nationalized, so the shorts could get burned. If you're short Deutsche Bank now, number one, you should have been doing it a couple of years ago when the puts were cheaper, out of the money puts were cheaper, you should have been doing it a couple of years ago. I've been talking about the problems in Deutsche Bank for a very long time. But, you know, they, they could change the rules. I'm friends with hedge fund managers, and during the 2008 financial crisis, Phil, most people don't remember this. If you're managing money professionally, you would. But a lot of people who are outright short banking stocks, especially in Europe, but also U.S. banks, especially if you were a hedge fund manager and you had your money at like Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Lehman Brothers or Bear Stearns, they basically canceled your shorts. Wow. So so you would have had a winning trade and would have made a lot of money. But your your broker your, who was clearing your trades as a hedge fund canceled your winning trades. And so the hedge fund managers that made money back then were the ones who bought out of the money puts and weren't outright shorting the stocks. But there were people who saw things coming in before 2008, made what what everyone would have thought in professional finance was smart bets, and the banks, larger banks, still changed the rules on them. And politicians and governments did too, to try to protect the banks. The rules were changed. So the shorts who would have made an enormous amount of money, some of them, their trades were just outright canceled. Heads they win, tails you lose. Welcome to dystopia. Exactly. The new, the new normal. And so I think, you know, if I had to summarize uh, Italy, you know, the Italian government's changing the rules. There was an Italian election recently. Right. And so I believe what's what's happening now is they're trying to redo the election because they they don't like the results. And look, that's similar to Brexit. Brexit was two year almost two years ago. And what has been done? <laughs> the people, the globalists, the elites, the political elites in Brussels, the political elites in London, the lawyers who were anti-Brexit, they've been dragging their heels and delaying these things in courts in any way they can. They're going to try to get a revote and deny people Brexit. And you know the really messed up thing about all of this, Phil, is that evil assholes like George Soros blame people like us for causing these problems. Look. Let's look at the speech you just gave, right? He's blaming populism and nationalism, people you know, speaking out against all the problems in society. He's blaming people like us who are calling things you know, reality like we see. It. He's blaming us for the problems. 
and saying that we're going to cause the next global financial crisis. Yeah, well, why wouldn't he? I mean, these guys have benefited. <laughs> they've benefited from the system for their whole lifetimes. Yeah, I know you've talked about Warren Buffett, and he's been your scumbag of the week or whatever in the past. And you know, he's a prime example. Look at how he's benefited from this system. And simultaneously, he's not a fan of cryptocurrency, which may potentially free more people, especially in third world socialist hell holes like Venezuela, more so than anything that's ever been created in all of human history. I mean, can you imagine if you're a poor person who's managed to start mining uh, Bitcoin in Venezuela, which is, by the way, happens to be the cheapest place in the world to mine Bitcoin. It's only f- like $531 in electricity costs to, to mine Bitcoin there because their uh, socialist Bernie Sanders utopia has uh, subsidized the electricity there. And, and can you imagine if you're lucky enough to put that on a keep key or a Ledger Nano S and get the heck out of there and move to a prosperous place? I mean, this really is the most evolutionary thing that's hit the world in a long time. And Warren Buffett and his cronies like Charlie Munger are totally against it. Well, why is that? Because that's not the system they've managed to benefit from. They've benefited from a central banking based system, just like George Soros has. Uh, They make big bets against governments and win, and they make more money in uh, the eighties than the rest of us will in our entire lifetimes. So uh, it's not a surprise to me that he's against uh, populism and maybe you, you and I would be too in, in uh, particular circumstances but uh, I think honestly it's going to be better for the world when people like George Soros and Warren Buffett really aren't in it anymore hopefully we can move beyond this uh, this system you know it, it's worked for some but for the most part it really hasn't worked for the masses and if you I mean if you need more proof Look no further than the fact that Donald Trump is president, right? I mean, here's a guy. I was reminded of it today. You know, the fact that uh, Ann Coulter appeared on some left-wing show and they asked her who's going to be the next president. She said Donald Trump. And everyone laughed at her. These people are elitists. They, they think they are the puppet masters and they make the world go round with their Keynesian central banking fiat-based debt base monetary systems, but uh, they're getting scared. They're kind of watching it all crumble around them, and they're losing power, and they don't like it. So I, I think that's really what you're seeing when he gives a speech like that. Well, the, the funny thing about George Soros, and he disagrees with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger about this, I, I would say that George Soros is actually a brilliant guy. I would just say that he has, number one, he has no morals, and number two, I think, you know, he's basically evil, but the man knows how to make money investing in trading in markets. He's He has a really winning track record. Maybe he manipulates markets, maybe he lies, cheats, steals on some of his investments or trades. Who knows all the details? Sometimes we only find out, you know, snippets of things, but... George Soros announced at the, be- at the beginning of April, Phil, that his hedge fund money, he's moving a lot of it into some of the larger cryptocurrencies. So, and I think, you know, that started besides the tax law selling ending in, uh, you know, tax day here in the U.S. in, in April, uh, April 17th. I think that George Soros news was actually big for a bottom in the cryptocurrencies, that a lot of people piggyback his trades. His, his views of markets are still extremely well respected. But, you know, that what he's saying about blaming the uh, financial crisis on people like us on free speech basically is ridiculous because people like George Soros, they caused the, the crisis in the European Union in the first place. You know, it was him spending all that money on lobbying, buying off puppet politicians, spending money on NGOs and non-governmental organizations to try to basically disrupt uh, duly elected governments, uh, you know, drastically change the the way the government's uh the way the people inside the government thought and the people themselves so you know with his open border policies and yet you know he's not taking any of the responsibility for any of his actions and all the lobbying dollars he spent i'm just fed up with it the mainstream media won't even talk about george soros and all the hypocrisy because you know he probably donates so much money and media matters uh spends a lot of time and money calling and trolling making sure the mainstream media says what they want but I mean, George, it's just ridiculous hearing the mainstream media, since this is Welcome to Stopia, I can sound off like this. I'm just tired of the mainstream media, you know, saying how evil and bad the NRA is with all their lobbying dollars and control of politicians. The NRA doesn't even have 10% of the money or power that George Soros does. George Soros spends tens of billions of dollars. The NRA doesn't spend anywhere near. 
and you don't hear anyone make this comparison, uh, at least on the mainstream media, at least on the mainstream media. But that George Soros speech is interesting. You know, he is he, he is giving us somewhat of a fair warning, though, that there is going to potentially be a financial crisis. He thinks it's going to start in Europe. Obviously, I, I disagree with him about him blaming it on the population waking up and populism and nationalism. You know, I think it's good people are waking up, especially in the United Kingdom, to how Brexit hasn't happened already and what's happening to Tommy Robinson just for, and you know, with this this arrest here, with the conviction and the arrest, I don't know if you've been following Phil, it's totally ridiculous. He didn't even say anything that hadn't already been repeated in the mainstream media. He was just totally targeted. They basically want him dead because uh, he's going to wake too many sheeple up. No, the UK is a mess, man. Like, I saw a video today on Twitter of this machete wielding guy on a bicycle, you know, trying to bust into somebody's car. I don't know if there was like some kind of altercation before the video started rolling, but that's just becoming commonplace over there. And I know, any, you know, we could look at the United States and have, say we have our own problems, but the pace at which they're being rapidly overrun as a totalitarian state, you know, it's pretty disturbing. I mean, oh, yeah. the, it, the UK was a place where I think, you know, our parents may have considered living at one time. And I wouldn't even want a vacation over there at this point. I mean, it's uh, it, it just seems to be unraveling. And then when you look at a situation like Tommy Robinson, we think we're so sophisticated, Jason. We think we're so wise, you know. But what we don't realize is that one day... Looking back, a historian will look at the Tommy Robinson case, and that'll look no different than like Henry VIII, you know, just chopping off his wives' heads <laughs> because of some kind of you know strange belief. Um, that that's really what we have here. I mean, this is a Orwellian society they're crafting over there, and I certainly wouldn't want to be a part of it. I mean, if, again. If, if I were like uh, a, a Chris Coney type who's mining Bitcoin, I would mine as much as I can and get out of that place because your freedoms are being stolen. And eventually they'll probably, uh, you know, they, they won't even let you leave, much less with your wealth. They're going to keep it all for themselves. They're going to take all of your rights and look no further than that case. That's a prime example. Yeah, it, it's just incredibly frustrating, all the things that are happening. The, the other news story that caught my eye, you know, with lack of liberty and there's so many people in the alt media and the gold community and even some libertarians and Austrian school people who are defending China and saying they hope China crashes a dollar and chi the Chinese are going to save the uh, us and the global economy from you know all the bad things that are happening. And if you're a Chinese citizen, I mean, the stuff that's been coming out is just totalitarian, totally totalitarian. 15 million Chinese have already been affected. And this number is obviously going to grow from their social credit score nonsense. 15 million Chinese have been denied access to fly on planes in mainland Chinese airports and ride on trains in mainland Chinese airports. And you know what, Phil? There was a CNET article in the last couple weeks. This thing's ramping up in the next two or three years. It's going to get even worse. There's going to be more totalitarian government with, with recording video and audio in the street. And the social credit score now... If you're a dissident, you speak out, you criticize the government, you do or say something wrong that the Chinese government, government arbitrarily decides that they do not like that you did or said, they can deny you the ability to rent an apartment, basically deny you the ability to be a normal adult. They can deny you the ability to borrow money. So if you're a student, you want to go get another degree, you want a, a small business loan for your, for your small business, you want to maybe take out a mortgage or something to buy a house, although the, the property bubble in China, you probably, the mortgages are probably too high, unless you're borrowing in the shadow banking system. And so even with the social credit score, Phil, you can be, if you have a ding on the social credit score from the Chinese government, you can be denied a job. So there's all these things that over the next like three years or so, the Chinese government's gonna be rolling out. This is very anti-freedom, very anti-free market, you know, very, and, and there's, I don't know how edited this was, but I saw a, a short video interview clip and there was Chinese citizens who were interviewed by like one of the, the Chinese government television stations and they were saying how good of an idea this was. So I don't know how many years of brainwashing that took. I don't know how many people they had to interview to get that response. But, you know, as someone who wants freedom of speech and, and liberty, this is very disturbing to me. 
Yeah, well, I think there's a certain segment of the population that's growing that thinks that government really can provide you security, and they're willing to give up plenty of freedoms for it. But they obviously don't understand history and what's happened to every single regime that exercised that model. Ultimately, you know, s- certain people ended up not only losing their freedoms but their lives. So whether it's Asia or, or China specifically or Europe – we really are uh, setting up a lot of dystopian countries around the planet. But what I think I'm interested in, Jason, you know, I wanted to get your take on this because I thought about this a lot. You know, I listened to a guy like Tom Woods and he says, you know, no matter what happens in the United States, I'm basically going to hunker down here because this is my home. And I really hope that, you know, you and I and our audience can hunker down here too. Um, I, I will say that Trump has certainly put a. Uh, not a stop, but he he slowed down the pace at which the globalists were winning. But that said, I mean, they're going to attempt to ruin the man's life. And as Ron Paul says, who who knows, maybe they'll even try to take his life. But well, I th- also he may have he may have sold out some concessions to the military industrial complex. So in exchange for maybe some better things here uh, here in the United States, he's allowing this warmongering neocon foreign policy with potentially new wars by bringing in John Bolton as his uh, foreign policy as his foreign policy advisor. So there's there's some either Trump has uh, maybe they got something on him. He was blackmailed or he sold out or agreed to a deal with the military industrial complex or deep state. But he's he's uh, if he was not already a neocon or war hawk before he became president, he's certainly bringing on a lot of them now as his advisors. And so he's he's headed towards, you know, being a full neocon now, which is downright scary. Uh, because John Bolton, you know, has gone on the record as saying, you know, that we need a regime change. Not only, uh, obviously, he said in North Korea, he said he wanted to go the Libya route, which is scary. But he also said, talked about, you know, invading Iran and then also, uh, you know, going into Venezuela. Yeah, it seems like there are opportunities for uh, military conquest have no limits. But, yeah, it makes you wonder, like, how did they get his mind right? on this you know why is it john bolton suddenly was selected to be a part of his administration you wonder if uh, i was in exchange for maybe staying alive a little bit longer of course you know i'm just speculating there being a conspiracy theorist for a moment but you know jason i wanted to ask you i mean with all of us living in such a dystopian world what places are left over you know if uh we all had to suddenly pack up and go somewhere else where there is sound money and free market economics and capitalism unfettered where where would you go where would it be most people don't have the the money saved up or the skills and knowledge to start over completely in another country um you know a lot a lot of people who want to move outside the united states they don't speak another language they don't have enough money and savings they don't have the right skills it would be a total it, it, i'm not saying it's it would be totally impossible but it would be extremely difficult compared to someone who had like a couple hundred thousand dollars who could speak multiple languages and at least somewhat fit into another culture by being able to speak a language somewhat decently and have some skills so i, I you know, in, I think the United States in certain parts, so obviously there's a financial crisis, I don't know, uh, in the near future. I don't know if it's going to start in the United States, but it will almost definitely spread here at some point. And I think, you know, for a lot a lot of things about the United States can still be saved. I mean, there is people here, you mentioned Trump bought us some time. I would, I would the analogy I would use is be kind of the temporary reprieve, maybe like the governor called in and the executioner's access delayed. <laughs> so right. he bought us maybe a couple years to try to figure out ways to wake more people up and uh, try to, you know, get more people on our side for liberty and freedom of speech and, you know, protecting the Second Amendment and things like that. And uh, obviously, I would like sound money brought back, but I don't think we're going to be able to have a reasonable sound money discussion with a lot of the mainstream people until uh, during and after the next financial crisis. So uh, unfortunately, but you know, I, I think there there is still a good amount of hope here in the United States. It's not totally lost because there are people, a good amount of people here that are fighting for some of the key things in the Constitution. Now, obviously, there's people that there's still millions of people on the other side who hate the Constitution. They blame capitalism for all the problems in society. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to, I really can't have a discussion with them. They don't want to listen. They don't want to hear anything I have to say. Their minds are made up. And so, unfortunately, a lot of them also, Phil, and you're not a single guy, but a lot of them also are single women here in the D.C. metro area. So I just swipe left or take screenshots for, for shits and giggles. Uh, that's it. But, you know, it's you, you save who you can. Uh, that's what I've tried to do with the work here on the channel. I've just tried to put my work out there, and if people like it, they like it. And if they don't, they don't. And I've just tried to work hard to improve and get better. But there's really, you know, there if, if you don't have capital, if you don't have skills, if you don't speak other languages, moving and starting over in another country is almost impossible. I mean, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it's going to be so difficult. You have to have like at least like some skills and being able to at least learn another language quickly. And if you're not willing to do that, starting over in another country is going to be almost almost impossible. I agree. I mean, change is a real hassle. I just look at it at the micro level. I mean, I used to use Skype to record my shows, and then I decided to move over to uh, Google live streaming. And just, you know, making that decision was monumental for me. And you think about, you know, people literally packing up and trying to flee some kind of totalitarian regime, even when they can feel it closing in around them. And even when their friends and family are telling, hey, I'm out of here. Uh, it, it's a very difficult decision to leave everything you know. You know, I, in, in reality, I'm very optimistic, though. I mean, if you look at the Bundy Ranch and things like that, uh, I think there will be pockets in this fruited plain where our rights will be protected. There will be certain people who come together and uh, you know form, you know, I wouldn't say a, a separate government, but certainly you know certain states are going to be better than others in terms of protecting their citizens. But uh, you know, well, there's, there's, there's no there's guarantee on who it's actually going to be. There's also a pension fund crisis coming with some of those states that are not going to protect their citizens. So you're, you're seeing that now in Illinois, where Illinois has an enormous financial crisis in that state. And so the politicians there are like, and the, and the Chicago Federal Reserve, I believe, suggested this recently. They said, OK, no problem. We'll just if you have a five hundred thousand dollar house that was inflated by devalued U.S. dollars and uh, debt based digital fiat currency, that was it, the inflated home price that you bought decades ago for one hundred thousand or less. And now it's worth over five hundred thousand. The city uh, excuse well, the city of Chicago and other parts of the state of Illinois, they're talking about raising property taxes fill up to an additional like five thousand per year. So, you know, if your house price went up and your incomes didn't, an extra 5000 or more per year in property taxes, most people are not going to be able to afford that. The Federal Reserve actually, and this is very interesting, at the end of this year, uh, excuse me, at the end of 2017, did a study. And what they found was that 50% of all American families that they surveyed cannot afford a $400 emergency, that they would have to put the whole thing on credit card. They do not have the money in the bank to afford, you know, a very serious medical expense or like their transmission blowing, like a major car repair or things like that. Yeah, and that's so. really why I do my podcast. I mean, it's more about trying to teach basic financial principles to those people who don't have $400 saved. Because how how is it they're going to survive when the government reneges on their promises? It's bound to happen. And your example there is a prime example. You know, they messed up. You messed up. You trusted us. You, you thought we were actually going to be uh, solid on your pension and it turns out we're not because we've taxed everyone to death all the uh, people who lay golden eggs have left and the takers are left behind there's no one to pull this wagon anymore i don't know if that was enough cliches that i could put into one <laughs> sense but you know that's the fact and, and if you look at any tax migration map there was one that came out in 2010 and I included it in my book because I thought it was great. I mean, it's obvious where people are leaving and where people are going. People are leaving places like California and they're going to places like Texas. And sure, the weather may not be as nice, but at some point you're not willing to pay the premium for that, especially if you're an earner and you're driving on terrible roads, you're sitting in traffic all the time, you're watching people sell food illegally on the street and nobody does anything about it while you're trying to really operate a bona fide business which is surrounded by homeless people and the streets are covered in needles. Why would you want to live through that? 
Why would you want to stay in a dystopian place like L.A.? Get the heck out of there and go someplace where your rights will be protected and you really can live the American dream. And a lot of people are finding that to be places like, you know, I just if you just look at a list of the top places for business, you know, places like Texas, uh, Virginia, I think New Hampshire might even be up there. These are all places that lean on the side of liberty. You know, even if they do have Democrat politicians, they're held in check by the citizenry. So. Um, I think uh, you're going to see more of that when uh, the the new map comes out in 2020. It's going to be even more stark for places like New York and uh, Illinois, and it should be because people intuitively vote their pocketbook and they know how they're doing, they know how they're feeling, and that's a good thing because we don't want uh, to be you know a milk cow for the state. I agree, Phil, and. Uh I've seen, I don't know about you, since we both live in the D.C. metro area, that's one of the benefits of you doing this show with me now. We can kind of make fun of the D.C. metro area a little bit. Glad and to. So I, huh, and so I see tons and tons of license plates now. It's increased a lot of people moving here from New York, New Jersey, California, uh, a lot of the Democrat states. And so a lot of these Democrats who are hypocrites, who say they hate capitalism, and some of them even have high salaries – they don't want to stay in those states where the taxes keep getting raised. They want to leave. They don't want to pay the tax taxes. So even if they say they hate capitalism and even if they say they don't mind uh, a lot of people paying higher taxes, they themselves, uh, not with not with uh, not with the way they what they're saying, you judge people by what they're actually doing and with their feet and their wallet. They're actually moving. <laughs> So, you know, this is the, this is the type of hypocrisy we're getting now. It's it's really sad, but, you know, it's a new normal. And so states like North Carolina and South Carolina, and I've had friends who've moved. There's tons of people from New York and New Jersey who cannot afford to retire in those states or, or they're older and they cannot afford to live there anymore and they're moving. And it's, you know, it just makes financial sense. Yeah, it and sure so does. I mean, I just look at my own family. My dad was one of eight kids. He's got six brothers who basically worked in New York for most of their lives. And guess where they're all retiring, Jason? Right down in Florida. And they all chose to live in the same community south of Orlando because people make choices and respond to incentives. And there's no incentive to stay in the state of New York and have your hard-earned wealth stolen from you so they can pay for social welfare programs. Nobody... Everyone intuitively becomes a capitalist when it's them. And if you think about, you know, a place like Venezuela, you know, what, what would Bernie Sanders rather? Would he rather be a senator in the Can United we drop States? Him off? Can we drop him off in Venezuela? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, uh, there's a, a great meme Bitcoin that I saw once that, of his picture, and he looks kind of clueless. And uh, it says Venezuela, question mark. Never heard of it. You know, what would he rather? Would he rather spout his socialist propaganda in what used to be the greatest free market country in the world, or would he rather be Maduro? I think, given his, uh, given a choice, he would rather be here in the United States because then he gets all the upside of capitalism while receiving all of the accolades of pretending to care for people from his lake house. Yes, and this is a man that didn't have a job until he was 40 years old, and his first job, I think, was a, a not a normal job. I think it was as a politician of a tiny little, he was a mayor of a tiny little town in Vermont. So he got to spout his socialist, you know, Marxist nonsense while he was getting paid as a politician. He didn't have to pursue uh he didn't have to produce any results in the real world like many of us listening to this podcast. No, it's great. I mean, and, you know, you look at uh, Obama, I think his net worth before he became president was something like a million bucks. And then by the time he got out eight years later, miraculously, he was worth $12 million. And now yeah. and signing a deal with Netflix worth $50 I was about million. to bring that up. Yeah. So it, it's great. After, it's after great. He appointed, after he appointed someone on the Netflix board of director or upper management as an ambassadorship. So there was a trade. Yeah. They, and really what's most embarrassing about it, he would belong to that aforementioned group, the bottom 10 percent, you know, the politicians and the central bankers. They don't even feel any guilt about it. I mean, you or I, if put in the same position, we would be so embarrassed. We, I don't think we would show our faces again to benefit like that from the state. And just so blatantly, you know, purportedly, you know, helping the little guy. 
but then you know turn around you're replaced by your arch enemy who you ridiculed during uh you know one of those state sponsored dinners and then you know appearing on a late night show ridiculing him and you know dropping the doing a mic drop on the phone about a tweet he said about you and then he's your successor you know that had to really stick in his craw but then you know to then get this multi-million dollar deal i'm honestly thinking about canceling my netflix subscription just out of spite you know i know it's a meaningless symbolic gesture but uh, i know people are actually doing that because this is just disgusting you know anybody anybody honest who sees a deal like this has to think, oh, you know, this is just typical tit for tat. And uh, the fact that these guys aren't embarrassed by it is really, they, should, they ought to be ashamed of themselves. Well, sometimes you need a break from reality. So hopefully you find some other type of TV show or movie content to replace. And you need, it's just good because if you look at all these news and information, a lot of it is depressing. Obviously, we're trying to present it in a little a little more sarcastic in Gallo's humor format. But yeah, it, it, a lot of the news story stuff that's coming out is extremely depressing right now, unfortunately. And I think, unfortunately, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But my, my listeners want uh, market analysis on this as well. So there are some interesting stuff that's been coming out about China. And so there's a lot of China bulls out there, whether it's Luke Groman, who's saying that the dollar is going to collapse soon, the Petro Yuan is going to collapse the dollar and send the gold price soaring, which, by the way, the dollar, since the Petro Yuan contract launched, the uh, according to our friend, our mutual friend, Lewis, he showed me a chart there of the gold price and the U.S. dollar index. The gold price has gone down since the Petro Yuan launched, and the U.S. dollar index has had a big rally. Anyway, anyways, though, uh, some of these big China bulls, you know, they just they say that uh, China is in great shape and the Western media is just lying about everything. OK, the Western media did was wrong about the ghost cities in China. I've had Dan Collins on who's lived in China for 20 years, and he has he has said that, you know, eventually these ghost cities eventually do fill up. But there are beneath the surface, there are enormous, enormous problems in China. And it's not me saying this. I am talking about officials at the People's Bank of China. So in November, Phil, I, I, don't, I don't know if you heard this on other past shows, I've talked about this, but the head of the People's Bank of China was talking about credit problems in China, Minsky moment, very unusual for a official in the Chinese government to be that honest. But the more recent story, and this is not from a US mainstream media company that said this, this is from the South China Morning Post, their economy section, and they quoted a former People's Bank of China official, and he's talking about the Chinese economy. And he says that the, in his view, uh, doing research and analysis about the Chinese economy, that there could be up to 80%, that's the real number in his opinion, of non-performing loans. And the official number, Phil, is only 2% of non-performing wow. loans in their banking system. So huge discrepancy there. And he is blaming how the majority of the Chinese economy, their GDP now, is based off real estate building and property bubbles and speculation. So, and... Another person, uh, although he's not libertarian or Austrian school, he's a common sense guy, at least with his investing, his politics are Democrat. But um, in terms of his investing, he's almost never wrong on a lot of his shorts. Sometimes it takes like a couple years for it to play out. But Jim Chanos and Jim Chanos says that I think around 60 percent of the Chinese economy now is based on, you know, a, a home and real estate. There's also like condos and commercial building of of a real estate and construction bubble. And that's like enormous percentage of global GDP. And he says he is heavily short a lot of the, those companies that's, uh, you know, involved in that part of the Chinese economy. So, you know, I, I think the, the, the large technology companies in China that are private are in good shape. But I think beneath the surface, there's a lot of problems as well in China. The other thing is the People's Bank of China's balance sheet. It's 220 trillion RMB and growing. And just in the last 12 months, Phil, guess how much credit that has, has been created in the Chinese, Chinese economy? Tell me. Six trillion US dollars okay. in 12 months. So in the in the last five years, they've they've uh, their credit has, has been increased by 30% of their GDP. It's, it's an enormous sum. And there's only about 40 countries in the history of the world that have done that in terms of credit growth. So there, there are unprecedented amounts of, of credit the last five or 10 years in the Chinese economy. And I'm not saying everything is going to totally collapse in China, but I'm saying there's going to be 
more currency devaluations in the near future in China. I don't know if it's going to be six months or 12 months or a couple years, but there's going to be currency devaluations and there's probably going to be bailouts of these corrupt, inefficient, wasteful, fraudulent uh, state-owned enterprises. I've read books about from people who have lived in China for years talking about all the inefficiency and corruption and problems by the state-owned enterprises, and they've borrowed a lot of US dollar debt too. So there is a lot of problems beneath the surface in China. And you know, in the in in the long term, China, China, the private sector in China, there is a lot of entrepreneurship there. But you know, if you're betting on China to not have a financial crisis, I don't know if I would take that bet. There's a there's a couple money managers. One of them is Mark Yusko, very smart guy. But he's like super bullish on China, and he says they're not going to have a financial crisis. I don't think I believe him. Well, you know, Jason, if I could take the other side of this argument, anytime I order something off of Amazon. Guess where it comes from, right? I mean, they make everything. They are a producer nation, and I, they've held this dollar peg for so long. So, you know, tell me, do you think they're actually worse off than we are? I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not that familiar with China and what it's like to live there, like uh, your previous guest. But you know, I can't imagine their great society, their social welfare programs, are anywhere near as abundant as they are here and on top of that you know they seem to be a hard working culture so you know deep down do you think despite the fact that indeed you know they've created a massive bubble that they're any worse than we are so the middle class in my opinion in china has not actually benefited nearly as much as they should have from china industrializing and their economic growth and the currency peg you mentioned is actually one of the major reasons why and so China, the Chinese government, the People's Bank of China and the Chinese government, by using a currency peg, they've actually siphoned off a lot of the gains that the average Chinese citizen would have had in purchasing power gains. And the Chinese government has you know, basically stolen that wealth and put it into a sovereign wealth fund to invest. And they're saying they're doing that for the future, but it's central planning. As you know, as an, someone who follows the Austrian school, there's a lot of waste and abuse and corruption and fraud with central planning. So there's, there's many trillions of dollars in waste. The other thing is 10 years ago, Phil, the Chinese government actually had a pretty darn clean balance sheet. It didn't have that much debt and credit. They had a lot of assets. They had a huge trade surplus. They were accumulating gold. They didn't have maybe that much gold 10 or 15 years ago, but they also didn't have a credit bubble. So yes, the Chinese economy has grown, but at the cost that they've done it, there's going to be hell to pay. A lot of people don't remember this, but if you go back through history, I think it was 15 years ago, the Chinese government, and they didn't obviously go and announce this publicly and give people fair warning if you were a citizen living in China, but they did a 60% currency devaluation basically overnight. And so as far, only a couple years ago, they did about, I think a 10 or 15% currency devaluation already, and it's still not enough. So they've done pretty large currency devaluations in the past. And so I, I guess if you talk with a lot of Chinese people who live there, they say it's pretty normal and they just shrug off their shoulders and they say they're used to it and they're used to paying higher prices for pretty much everything every couple months when they go and buy stuff at the stores there. But, you know, as an American citizen, you know, that's not something we like. But, you know, people in other, other governments are, are used to stuff like that, unfortunately. So this is the thing you, earlier in the show that you mentioned that, like, leaving the U.S. and can we bring back... Or, or maintain some of the important freedoms and ideals that we have here. Well, people in other countries are used to such really horrible behavior by their governments and corruption and stuff, like really bad and being able to live and deal with it, that on a relative basis, the U.S. is actually still appealing. I mean, there's a ton of people, many millions of people, Phil, in other countries who would love to come to the United States and start over and have economic opportunity here. A lot of people in other countries, especially if you're in Venezuela, but a lot of people in a lot of other countries still view on a relative basis the U.S. as having more economic opportunity and being more free. Even though, you know, you and me have talked about this off, off record, uh, you know, not on the recording and in today's show, that there are a lot of things bad here in the U.S. and some of them are getting worse and some of them are starting to improve again. But, you know, you just have to see a global picture from different people's perspectives. And so from other people's perspectives, if you live in another country, the U.S. may not look so bad. Yeah, I guess it is all relative, but you know, I'm just looking at a article here that was posted about three hours ago on Market Watch. What was it entitled? 
uh, let's see here. The real unemployment rate reached a 17-year low. Here's why that's a big deal. And uh, it goes on to say you have to scroll down a ways. But when you finally get there, it says that uh, the percentage of Americans 16 or older who are in the labor force is just 62.7%, well below the 66.4% rate that prevailed before the Great Recession. So I just think a lot of Americans are on the dole. They have uh, worthless college diplomas. They're waiting uh, tables and tending bar and making coffee. I just, uh, you know, I, I think we're in serious trouble. And yeah, we can talk about the trouble around the world. But frankly, you know, since I am a dad, I'm more concerned about what happens here. And I'm worried about the dystopian environment that we're creating here as a result of these, you know, phony economic statistics that come out of our government. I think really, you know, the stock market can go up and unemployment can supposedly go down. But the real underlining underlying fundamentals of the U.S. economy are only getting worse year by year. And people felt that in their pocketbooks, and they went to the polls in 2016. I think, you know, uh, the president's got really one shot. It'll be interesting to see what happens in another couple of years. Uh, you know, it seems like there's a raging debate o- over whether he has a chance of getting reelected or not because people aren't going to be patient. You know, he can talk a big game and say, you know, look at all the good I'm doing, but people know how they're doing. And uh, there's some circles they're saying he, he may not run again. Uh, that, that he might just have Pence do it because he might not actually really like the job. Uh, I wouldn't either. I wouldn't want that job. I don't know about you. But uh, yeah, if he had to tell the truth, I think uh, it would be pretty harsh. And the truth is, is that uh, you know a lot of people are unemployed. They're underemployed. They can't find good jobs. Some people have you know a million dollars in student loan debts. We saw that article come out this week. Uh, fortunately, you know some of them are actually doctors, but. That's like being an indentured servant, you know, especially when you compare it to the way our grandparents and our, even our parents had it. And uh, no, nobody wants to feel like they're a servant for the state. But unfortunately, here in the U.S., that is the present condition. Yeah, it, it's very unfortunate. And the labor participation rate, the people who are joining the workforce are my parents' age. There are the people who, because of the manipulation of interest rates and – You know, basically all the policies of the central bankers taking uh, manipulating markets and and taking things away that they've had to go back to work because they can't replace the income. Financial repression, that's the word I was looking for because uh, the phrase I was looking for. Financial repression, they can't earn a decent income on their savings. And so they're having to take more risk and, you know, they're having to go back to work and get another job. And the job statistics say this. And also, you know, the people who are just graduating college or people 35 and under are not getting the good employment opportunities. There's a lot of people trying to put a life together with two or three part time jobs and not a good high paying full time job. You know, this, unfortunately, is the new normal. And, you know, the the thing is right now, uh, you know, you have a couple listener questions, one of them. If I could summarize, it was about the bond market. And so I'm not a bond market expert, but I do interview, you know, people who spend all their time doing this and who have traded bonds. Dr. Mark Faber was involved, uh, I believe, with Michael Milken in in some capacity in creating the junk bond market. And so he's been a bond trader as one of his jobs in the financial industry. He's been in the financial industry for many decades. And the 10-year bond, we're recording this, Phil, on Friday, June 1st, 2018. And the 10-year bond, you know, a couple, a week or two ago, it was at 3.05% yield. And we had the billionaire bond king, Jeff Gunlock, who's considered one of the uh, foremost experts in the bond market. And he thought that once that bond yield got there, it would basically run away and it would kind of be a run on bonds. The bond bear market would accelerate. The bond vigilantes would come into the bond market on the 10-year and run that yield up and it would start to cause huge, huge problems. But the... The 10-year bond, a couple weeks later, is back down. It didn't break out at 3.05. It actually dropped, and now it's below 3. It's at, when we're recording this, at 2.895%. And still, you know, that's not a huge return on your money, but from a financial perspective for the U.S. government, you know, it's starting to creep up there. Uh, We're almost at $22 trillion in total national debt. I did a short video on this when we went over $21 trillion, and we're almost already to $22 trillion because the Trump tax cuts were not real cuts. They were there was no real cuts in government spending. It was just basically bad supply side economics. Although the government, the phony government statistics, like you said, may look good, 
But, you know, if once we are over $22, tri $22 trillion in national debt, every 1% increase in interest rates is going to be $220 billion with a B in interest payments, more per year that the U.S. government is going to have to go. So if interest rates do go higher, you know, maybe that would be good somewhat for some retirees with their savings, but that would be also extremely onerous for governments and corporations that have borrowed too many dollars and have dollar-denominated de debt. The other thing that people should watch is the dollar index. So the dollar index did was continuing its rally earlier this week. It was up to around 95. It's had a little correction down to 94. There's not on the long-term charts, there's not a lot of support and resistance levels in this area for the dollar index. So as I pointed out in other short videos and talked about in other shows, the main support and resistance levels for the dollar index, the dollar index could have a wide trading range. It has big support on the long-term charts at 88, and it has a big overhead resistance on the dollar index around 100 and 102. So I still think in the short term, we could continue a dollar rally, but if the dollar index does continue to rally, especially Phil with the problems in Europe. So we, I didn't mention this earlier, but one of the most important things is as long as there's perceived to be more and more problems in Europe with the European countries, with European elections, with Brexit, with European banks, that's actually going to be good for the US dollar and the dollar index on a relative basis. Why? Because the euro makes up an enormous component of the dollar index. So as long as Europe looks weak, the dollar on a relative basis will appear stronger than it probably actually is. And but but if the dollar index does break out above overhead resistance, and I would say that that level is like one of two ish. And George Soros talked about this in his speech. He was warning that if the dollar continues to George Soros says this dollar level is too high. I, I disagree with him. If the dollar index does break out above overhead resistance, say 102, which it hasn't been at that level since I think January 2017, since it had a really large correction starting then for over a year. If it does break out above overhead resistance at 102, there would be probably warning signals of a financial crisis. So there's multiple things, Phil, that people, our listeners, should watch out for. That's a big spike in the 10-year bond yield. That's the dollar index, either breaking below support levels of 88 or strengthening above support levels in the 100 to 102 levels. Those would be warning signals. The other one is the oil price. I've talked about that in recent interviews. The oil, oil price right now, it's actually started to have a correction this week. Uh, WTI is down below $70 a barrel, and Brent crude's uh, back down to 76 and change. So the oil price, if it did continue to go higher, that would be basically like a tax or an interest rate hike on the consumer. And as we've outlined earlier in the show, Phil, the consumer, especially American consumer, does not have a lot of discretionary income. If they're paying $4 a gallon uh, in a lot of states where they're not used to high gas prices or $5 a gallon, if the oil price would have, say, gone to $100 a barrel or higher, that would have you know, potentially at some point crashed the economy. So we're not at those levels yet, but that's something that people need to pay attention to. The other thing I would add to with, you know, quick wrap up here of markets, uh, at least non-cryptocurrency ones, and Phil, if you want to talk about cryptocurrencies in a second, is gold and silver. So surprisingly, despite this dollar rally, guys, gold and silver holding up pretty good. Gold and silver holding up pretty good. Gold has not dropped below 1280 support levels. It, uh, as of this recording, it's at uh, 1294, not bad. It's pretty. It's holding up pretty good, all things considered, with a dollar rally on the dollar index, and silver is holding up above 16 and 16.38. So as of right now, gold has not broken below support level. Same thing for silver; it hasn't broken below 16. And I think you know, at those levels, if it breaks below those support levels, I don't think it's going to stay there that long because I've outlined the case why the supply, the miners, the primary gold and primary silver miners, really don't have much margins at below those prices. So I think gold and silver are kind of staying around the levels of production costs, maybe a little bit above those levels right now. And I don't think they're going to go much lower, even with a strong dollar. I think they're probably putting in a bottom. And it seems that the dips are bought. And there's, a, I'll attach a link to this. There's actually a really interesting article from Sprott Money from David Brady, who I follow on Twitter. He's a professional money manager for 25 years. And he thinks that gold's actually basically put in a bottom, and he expects over the next three weeks or so gold to break out above 1360. 
So I'll attach a link to that article in the information section. You could check it out. He lays out the case with charts and analysis of the commitment of traders, why he thinks that despite this dollar rally, gold's close to breaking out. Well, I'm not sure he's right. I hope he's right. One thing I'll go out on a limb and say, I don't think we'll see the Huey index below 100. You know, By the time it got down that low, back in late 2015, early 2016, I just said, you know what, to heck with this. I took Mrs. Kennedy's retirement money and just went all in <laughs> because I'm like, this is insane. This is nuts. You know, they, the amount of pressure, the phony pressure they've put on gold and silver over these last seven years is just amazing. But I really think the uh, laws of economics are beginning to tighten around Keynesianism. So they uh, they may try. They may try to keep uh, this up. You know, people, I'm sure your audience, some of them get a little skeptical over time. They say to themselves, hey, you know, you guys, guys like you have been talking about this for so long. But, you know, I use these two examples all the time. I'm like, hey, you know, if uh, you looked at Bernie Madoff in 2000 and and uh, you kept a, if you started a podcast talking about him for eight long years and you just kept pounding the table, if you kept pounding the table, Jason, and saying, you know, Bernie Madoff is running a Ponzi scheme and your name of your podcast was Bernie Madoff is running a Ponzi scheme, you know, people would have gotten tired of listening. And the same is true, you know, uh, for Lance Armstrong, you know, winning seven tour, tours to France or whatever, however you would say it. And, uh, you know, you could say, hey, he won that on artificial stimulus and you could have uh, – created a podcast called oh. Lance Armstrong is cheating <laughs> and talked about that for 10 years. In the end, you were ultimately right, there, but uh, you had well, to there was a lot of There was a lot of people that were speaking out about Lance cheating, and he sued all of them. He bullied, intimidated, sued. Look at Harvey Weinstein. There was people who spoke out, and look at all the money, and he hired you know Israeli what uh, professional security guards to harass and intimidate them. So, you know, people in power, even if they're liars, cheaters, and frauds, you know, the truth try, does try to come out eventually. Right. And, you know, this this is the world we're living in now. The, the funny thing, you know, with gold and silver manipulation is that in a short amount of time, the Department of Justice, I don't know if you saw this, just opened up an investigation into Bitcoin price manipulation. And they're saying that that there's – okay, let me let me read my notes here. They're saying that there's spoofing going on and that high-frequency trading algorithms have been manipulating the Bitcoin price. So, you know, we've been saying that this stuff has been happening for years in the gold and silver markets, and yet the CFTC – Basically, after a five-year investigation, closed their investigation, their official investigation. And yes, there's been fines for Deutsche Bank manipulating the London gold fix and London silver fix. And there's been banks getting fined for manipulating LIBOR. But, you know, when you try to bring up to people that gold and silver manipulated, it's, it's just crickets. But it's interesting that they're looking into Bitcoin price manipulation. There's also been a lot of manipulation on the upside in Bitcoin. I spoke uh, off the record with someone who works at a large Bitcoin mining company, and he was telling me how there's enormous price manipulation, what in the U.S. would be illegal wash trading and get you into prison, where basically, Phil, you and me decide that we're going to manipulate a cryptocurrency price higher, so I'm going to I'm gonna put in a bid at one price, and you're going to put in a bid at a higher price, and we're just going to trade back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to paint the tape and move it higher. Right. And so in the U.S., that's obviously been illegal for a long time. If we got caught, we would go to prison for a while for that white collar criminals. But in other cryptocurrency exchanges, it's not illegal and no one's been caught doing it. So the U.S. though is going after people for spoofing. That is, that that actually happens. The spoof trading where the bids are removed. There's uh, I sent you a couple links to some of the definitions of spoofing, which people are not uh, might not be familiar with. And that's where basically you can place a bid. For people to see and then you pull the bid so uh, or all these trading machines these high frequency trading algorithms trading machines can pull the bids at once and so some of the markets could go low bid or no bid pretty quick and you know it's technically illegal but i don't exactly see a bunch of of the trading programs and hedge funds that do it on a daily basis are going to prison you know occasionally they do bust some people a small amount of people but there's so many firms that are doing this on a daily basis that are not going to prison for it. Yeah. I mean, I don't claim to be some kind of crypto genius, but one thing I will say is that unlike the gold and silver market, I, the let's just look at Bitcoin. It appears to be far more transparent, right? Because it is an open ledger. So if you look at the Mt. Gox hack, 
we have more intelligent people living on this planet than in all of combined human history before. Uh, and that's bound to happen with 7 billion people. So some smart people put together this graphic of where exactly did all those stolen Bitcoin go. And they created this beautiful image that everyone can take a look at. If you Google it, you can pull it up. And I think that's the beauty of cryptocurrency is you it won't take long. You know, They may be able to get away with this stuff in the short run, but because it is a worldwide market, I think in the long run, you really can trust a slow, steady, uh, increasing trend over time. And it's going to be volatile. I mean, this is going to be a wild ride. And this is what I tell people on my show all the time. I mean, this is what you are going to get when a monetary system is replaced. It's going to be volatile. I think that's really what's happening. But yeah, I mean, this stuff should be prosecuted, but that really requires the rule of law, Jason, and that's the biggest problem. And, and that's why guys like me are buying Bitcoin, because we don't have the government, the legal system, the political system, and the monetary system that our grandparents had. And and that's why guys like you and me are doing shows like this. Exactly. And, you know, the, the cryptos are holding up pretty decently. Bitcoin dominance is down a lot, though, compared to what it was, uh, I think, in November of 2017. It was at one point, what, up almost to 80 percent of Bitcoin dominance of the market cap. And now it's down. It's basically cut in half. It, it peaked in the high half. 60s uh, in oh, December. Okay. Yeah. Or the, the mid 60s. And then uh, fell as low as 32 percent. These are coin market cap statistics. And now it's uh, sitting somewhere close to 40 percent. In my opinion, I think it's going to rise over the next uh, couple months. We'll see. I think when ultimately it's done with this run, it could be over 50 percent. Uh, you can check you know, coin market cap and OCFX to kind of compare and contrast the two numbers. But uh, I think there's just a lot of altcoins that are going to go to zero. And where else do you go? Do you go back into dollars or do you go into Bitcoin? I think a lot of people are probably going to choose Bitcoin. Well, I, I think do, some, holding some dollars for opportunity in case there's a stock market crash, uh, in case some assets go on sale. Because in 2008, if you had cash, there were good stocks to buy. There was real estate to buy. So I would not want to hold cash in the long term. You're going to be a loser because obviously all these central banks, whether it's the European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, Federal Reserve, or People's Bank of China, they're all trapped. They're all trapped. There's going to be some forms of bailouts, QE, and currency devaluations going forward. And so to avoid the central bankers trap, you know, you need to have some type of diversification and you need to have some, at least some cash for opportunities. But, you know, as we wrap up the show here, <laughs> a couple more, what, one more, one more scumbag before I bring it up. Actually, it's a group of scumbags. So if you have not seen any of the James O'Keefe Project Veritas videos, the new ones, go check those out. You know, the teachers unions that he's been exposing for their hiding of assaulting kids and having sex with students in Michigan and New Jersey, protecting teachers. It's it's totally uh, deplorable. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm trying, trying, to, trying to think of the right word here. Yeah, I guess I guess dystopian is fair. <laughs> well. It's it, it's it's just unbelievable yeah, it's that, that the United it's just unbelievable that the United States has gotten this low. So I know the United States was not always the most just country, and so there was you know gangs running or political bosses running the country for a while in our history. But you know we thought we had cleaned a lot of that stuff up, and now here we are again with um, you know enormous bureaucracy, enormous corruption, and basically people getting away. Who you who you wouldn't think are uh, people in positions of trust who are getting away, you know, with basically felonies. It's just really sad. Yeah, no, it is sad. You know, I, I, I'll bring his name up again when you've had Charles Ortel on. You know, he's a great guy, a smart guy, but uh, I can't help but think, you know, he kind of harkens back to an era where people were honest. <laughs> and he's, you know, say, hey, you're going to get in big trouble for doing this. And it's like, yeah, you you get in big trouble for doing these things when you live under a government that exercises the rule of law and that's the big problem you know we basically had uh, a regime where there were no consequences <laughs> and, that, and that's the, I, the aforementioned netflix deal but that, that was that's what makes it so disgusting to me you know i think there was a time if adam carolla talks about it all the time where you know it was a better time when people got dressed up to go on an airplane now people you know walk up there on their barefoot and start doing yoga in the aisle i mean people were better before and that's really it's a it's a symptom of a much greater problem in that uh, people are more selfish now 
And uh, I think, you know, well, that's why you and I are going to have no problem churning these episodes out because of the type of people that we're living with these days. They're, they're not quality people. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who are who are blinded by the bread and circus and celebrity gossip. And, you know, I like sports, but there's so many people now where it's consumed all their lives and they don't really understand what's really going on. But you, you brought up airplanes. I mean, airplanes, the airlines themselves now, the TSA is causing enormous problems at airports. I'm sure private security could do things a lot better. Airplanes, a lot of them are overpriced and inefficient and dirty and disgusting and you know people now are having sex in public on airplanes like i'm not talking about the mile high club in a bathroom like there's videos of people trying to like you know when everyone else is asleep you know it's it's bad people are trying to like the stuff people are willing to do or say in public like whether it's in san francisco or la in those homeless towns it's it's just gross and this is this is what society is devolving into it's basically you know if you go back a lot of this stuff is turning into what rome happened towards the end it's it's getting to that level of degeneracy and immorality and corruption. Yeah, one of my Patreon patrons pointed that out. He says he really loves the things you tweet about, you know, potential dating uh, candidates <laughs> and just how shallow the pool is these days. But that's just another symptom of the problem. You know, I, I forget who said it, but somebody was making the point that, you know, when when women start to behave like this, that really is a telltale sign of a society that's on the brink. Uh, you know, women really need to be kind of the uh, the, what, the kinder, gentler sex or whatever. And uh, I'm just glad I'm married to Mrs. Kennedy because, you know, compared to what I <laughs> – some of the candidates I see you posting about, it, uh, it really – it's another symptom of a much bigger problem that we're talking about on this show. Well, I, I... – I don't want to talk about this too much to get myself in trouble, but I, uh, you know, I think you know modern women, they, uh, they've lost a lot of the skills that used to. They used to be, you know, quietly tough, and they had all these skills, and you know, they could bring up a family and and you know help the family through tough times. And nowadays, like a lot of the women in the in, in a family, you know, they just want to get divorced immediately and take a man's money, and it's it's so bad. I have literally Phil. I don't want to talk about this too much, but I have literally had women that I was about to take on a first date here in the D.C. metro area throw temper tantrums because I was only going to spend $100 on them for a dinner date. Like, literally. it's, And then I just, like, you know, unmatched them, stopped talking to them. It's it, it's just, it's get it's gotten that bad where they, compl they complain about, you know, even basic things like that. They take things for granted, the level of spoiledness. And, um, you know, the, the modern things, is, it's, it's just really screwed up a lot of, it's not just, you know, women, uh, men are fucked up too. Yeah, no. <laughs> There's a lot, I, I don't even have that many real, real in life friends anymore. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the male friends I have, like are hardcore brainwashed or friends I used to have in college are hardcore brainwashed too. So, uh, people in general are just totally messed up nowadays. And, um, you know, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I met you through my podcast here and you're local, but you know, it's just real tough to find in in person friends anymore. It it I uh, most of my friends are online now. They listen to this podcast, and I met them through Twitter. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, that's the unfortunate part about social media is, although it seems on the surface to have brought us closer together, we've never been more far apart. Well, I think all of, a lot of it's also that I just live in the area. It's like a magnet, and it attracts like the most extreme, like hardcore leftist people. They want to come here and they want like a government job for a hundred, hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars or more per year, and then they complain they're underpaid. Some of them don't do any work. You know, they hate capitalism, but yet like they want to go on an expensive vacation every couple of weeks. They uh they drive a BMW or Mercedes, you know they eat they drink a coffee at Starbucks every day. They have nothing but Apple products, and they say how much they hate capitalism. That's the type of people this area in the DC metro area attracts, unfortunately. Yeah. Now a quick story before we wrap up. I was complaining to uh, I was my brother's best man, and his other groomsmen worked for Deloitte in Washington D.C. And I had expressed to him the fact that I had received a job offer from Anderson before as an intern before it collapsed as a result of the Enron fraud. So I was one of the last interns to work for Anderson. And I told him, you know, I really did not enjoy my internship. And it really turned me off to big four accounting to the point where I never worked in that environment. He was like, well, let me tell you, 
Phil, I mean, the environment in D.C. is so toxic. I had to leave t- for New York City to get out of it. So that just goes to show you. I mean, it uh, it's a it's a horrible environment. I, I, John and I went to go see Dave Smith at uh, Comedy Club, and the first thing out of his mouth was, "I don't know how any of you people could stand to live in this effing place." It, it was a great line. But uh, he was right. I mean, it, it's really kind of the the epicenter of evil. Going from D.C. to New York City is like going from the frying pan into the fire. I mean, obviously, there's probably going to be more people who like capitalism more in New York City. But a lot of them who work on Wall Street, a lot of most people don't because the stereotype is that like a lot of rich Wall Street people and people in corporations are rich Republicans. Maybe decades ago that was true. But we we're discussing before we start recording that, you know, that stereotype is no longer true at all. It isn't. And so there's there's like five or six major cities where a lot of the money and power and influence come from in the United States that filters to New York City and D.C. And almost all the cities are controlled by hardcore Democrat politicians. And the majority of the wealthiest people in those cities are very, very hardcore Democrat. Yeah. No. But, you know, the, the stereotype says otherwise. The stereotype says otherwise. And, you know, we're in a society now here in the United States where a lot of people say they hate capitalism. The polls are saying that a lot of people still, even though Trump won, uh, Hillary Clinton said that, you know, if she would have been more socialistic like Bernie Sanders, she would have won the election. So, you know, a lot of these polls are saying that people, a lot of people in the United States still prefer socialism. But a lot of those people, Phil, if you ask them, and I've tried to have a couple conversations with them as we wrap up here, that... You know, what don't you like about capitalism? Well, they blame they just repeat the same phrase that it causes all the problems of society. They can't even give you a proper definition of capitalism. So they hate something that they can't even properly define. And, you know, that's the dystopian society that we have where they've been basically brainwashed for many years to hate something that they don't even know what it really is. Yeah. I mean, we saw it during the uh, the protests there in New York right back uh, several years ago. When, what's the park? Is it Bugatti Park? I can't remember. And is that the Occupy, Occupy protest, protest that Peter Schiff went right. that Peter Schiff went to with the microphone? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They don't even really he know had, what they're. He had against. some balls for going. He had some balls for going there. I mean, I, I didn't see when I saw that video. I didn't see Antifa was there, but you know, nowadays Antifa probably would have showed up and they probably would have beaten him with a baseball bat or thrown a urine bag at his head. Oh yeah, those were that was probably the green shoots of Antifa back then. And I don't th- and also he I think he had a bodyguard, so he wasn't foolish enough to go down there alone. Only one bodyguard you would have needed an <laughs> army now. I mean, look, Lauren Southern who's like, you know, this small petite blonde girl and like she has to have an army guarding her where she speaks. It's just totally the the ridiculousness. Like a lot of these, you know, hardcore Democrats used to be pro free speech decades ago, but now that they've gotten their control of the government, their bureaucracy, and they've gotten all their political power, they don't want free speech anymore. I'm totally shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally shocked. Well, uh, on that note, Phil, we, we're almost at an hour and a half for our first episode together. So we want to thank our listeners for this uh for listening to this episode and if you have any other questions i don't know if we're going to have listener questions for the next show but maybe i briefly touched on that uh the normal format for welcome dystopia is no listener questions but if you guys in the comment section want us to answer some listener questions maybe we'll do that depending on how you respond in the comment section but that's it for now i don't have anything else to say i actually have a sore throat so uh i'm gonna go take a throat lozenge Phil, anything else you want to say before we wrap this sucker up? No. Uh, can I d- plug my show, or will we do that next time? For sure. For sure. Yeah. For so sure. if uh, folks, you know, y- y- folks in your audience are obviously really bright, right? That's why they listen to Wall Street for Main Street. But I'm sure they have people in their life who are totally clueless, and that's where Kennedy Financial comes in. We can teach people the basics. We do it pro, no- pro bono, talking about budgets buying a house, student loans, and things like that. And my brother John and I do that podcast every week, and, and it's fun. And uh, really, it's geared toward just trying to be a baseline for people. I mean, th- this is like master's level stuff. You know, your, your folks get it. But uh, for anybody in their life who is just totally clueless, that might be a good starting point for them. So, you know, I'll refer them over to the Kennedy Financial Podcast. Yeah, we, we try to do a mix of beginner stuff, intermediate and advanced 
Uh, obviously, there's better shows than mine for really advanced stuff. Like there's Macro Voices, which is free, and then there's Real Vision TV, which is paid. Real Vision TV also is starting to add some beginners content, but the price on that just dropped and they just doubled the content. So if our listeners want some more advanced stuff, they can check things out at Real Vision TV. The price is now went down from $600 a year subscription down to 180 So it's more affordable for people on Main Street out there. Maybe that's what I'll do with my Netflix money. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. But they don't have kids programming for your for your kids, so uh, maybe you should find some uh, some good paid content there for your kids. Yeah. <laughs> good deal. Oh, okay. Well, that wraps it up. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the twenty thousand YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information, analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.